I'm trying to grow my business and I didn't feel like I could afford to say no. I think people think about boundaries as telling other people what to do. And that could not be farther from the truth. I am launching a health and wellness company telling other people how to change their diet in order to be their optimal definition of health. And I'm exhausted and burned out and stressed out of my mind and I'm not sleeping and I'm cranky and I'm not seeing friends. I have no boundaries whatsoever. There are a lot of misconceptions about boundaries. You've already said that to you, boundaries feel selfish. Oh, super selfish, super selfish. I really had to do the incredibly hard work of recognizing these basic life skills we're not taught. We have to pick up along the way. We need to learn about it and we need to start breaking these patterns so that we can have healthier communication, healthier relationships and better mental health for all of us. I am curious why write this book? Why make this like your mission? I think boundaries are one of those essential life skills like credit management or time management that nobody teaches us about. We don't learn about them in school or in college. They're not part of our professional development curriculum. And usually only in moments of crisis do we realize that we are lacking this skill and we need to develop this skill. My real origin with boundaries came from Whole30. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of Whole30. It's a 30-day elimination program that I co-founded in 2009. And in the earliest days of the Whole30, I quickly realized that leading people through this program where you eliminate a bunch of foods for a month and then reintroduce them at the end, people really struggled to say no, especially in social settings and especially when faced with peer pressure around things like birthday party pizza or the wine at happy hour or the break room donuts. So I started said I started helping people learn to say no in those scenarios. And once people figured out I was good at helping them say no there, then they started asking me about their pushy mother-in-law or their toxic coworker or their best friend who's always emotionally dumping. And the conversation naturally morphed in from setting boundaries around food and alcohol in terms of your health efforts to setting and holding boundaries in all of your relationships to help you relieve anxiety and dread and preserve your time and energy and finances and mental health. So it was a very natural progression for me over the last 14 years. It's funny because you skipped over that part where you're like, hey, they don't teach us about credit management. They don't teach us about goal setting. They don't really teach us how to communicate properly to people or, or to write, really, like in the real world. They don't teach us about how to manage difficult people or to negotiate. Yeah. Or like, like now that I'm thinking about it, I don't feel like they teach us any of them. No, I spent a lot of time on trigonometry. And I can't tell you the last time I used the A plus B squared equals C squared, but I could really have used a lot of negotiation help or boundary help or credit management help, especially when I was in college. Yes, these are basic life skills that we're not taught. We have to pick up along the way. And when it comes to boundaries, not only are we not taught, but very often they're not modeled for us. My family oh, yeah. did not grow up setting and holding healthy boundaries. And certainly my mom's parents did not. So I feel like this is the generation now that's like, okay, this is really important. We need to learn about it. And we need to start breaking these patterns so that we can have healthier communication, healthier relationships and better mental health for all of us. Okay, this is going to be so cool because especially for anyone who's going through any kind of transformation or change. And let's be honest, like if you're listening to this right now, you are changing whether you want to or not. We either get to decide who we change into or we just let it happen to us. But let's say that you're deciding and you're in control and you've decided that you want to change. And when I think about boundaries, it's interesting to me that you went straight to relationships because I thought about how hard it was for me to get control of my schedule as an entrepreneur or what I could say or couldn't say to my team. Or when a client calls me and says, I need you to do this project that is frankly out of scope of what we normally do. Or I just, I found myself saying yes to everything because I had built a business and a schedule and a life and as a husband and as a father, and I'm sure everyone listening feels this way. Like you build your life to the point where you feel like you have to say yes, because if you say no, the mouse trap will just fly apart at the seams. <laughs> Did you ever experience that yourself? I definitely as an entrepreneur, I quit my nine to five job in 2010 to take Whole30 full time. It was the best paying job I ever had. It was with a really stable insurance company. I was in middle management. 
I had benefits and health insurance and, and I left that. And when I became an entrepreneur, I had no boundaries whatsoever. So if you sent me an email on a Sunday night asking me a question, I would stop everything I was doing and answer it. If somebody needed a blog post, I would stop everything I was doing and write it up. If a workshop request came in while I was traveling, I would stop. I felt like I couldn't say no to anything because I felt like A, hustle culture teaches us that we have to grind 24 seven. And if we're not entrepreneuring, right, right. I'll sleep when I'm dead. You're sleeping and I'm still working. It's that like girl boss hustle culture for me, at least. And then I felt like if I said no, I would lose opportunities and I'm trying to grow my business. And I didn't feel like I could afford to say no. And within six months, I had basically run myself into the ground. I am launching a health and wellness company telling other people how to change their diets in order to be their optimal definition of health. And I'm exhausted and burned out and stressed out of my mind. And I'm not sleeping and I'm cranky and I'm not seeing friends and I'm not seeing family. And I was like, this is not okay. So yes, I had that same experience. (laughs) (laughs) And so when we feel like everything is flying apart at the seams and we have to keep the machine fed, we have to keep the mousetrap moving, we have to stay on the hamster wheel. You can use whatever analogy you want. We got a lot of them. When you have to keep up with everything... I just think saying no or setting boundaries, and I don't know if those are the same thing or not, but they feel really selfish. They feel like my job is to, I need to make money. I need to please clients. I need to make my spouse happy. My kids are suffering. I need to make them feel better. Like for any of us who are leaders, most leaders actually give and give and give and give, which is why people see us as leaders. They're like, oh good, you can solve all my problems for me. And we just keep taking on more and more. So what do we do with this if we're feeling this pinch right now? Oh, see, I think I'm an excellent leader because my team trusts me to say what I mean and mean what I say. And here's the example. So You have this client that asks you to take on this project and it's outside of scope, but you want to be nice. You want to make this client happy. So you say yes. How do you show up for that client? You show up a little resentfully. You show up a little begrudgingly. You're probably not as deeply invested in this project as you could be or should be because you have so many other things going on and this is putting you above your capacity. So now your client's not super happy because you said yes and you're not delivering the way that they wanted you to deliver. You feel bad because you're not showing up the way that you want to and you know you're disappointing your client, that maybe is spilling over into your home life, into your relationship with your spouse and your kids and your hobbies and your sleep and now you're stressed. Saying no, setting a boundary in this situation is not selfish. It is the kindest thing that you could do for the relationship. And it's actually the best thing that you could do for your business because now you're having a direct, clear conversation. What you've asked me to do is outside scope. So here's what I can do. I can either do just this little piece of it and still turn it in on time, or I can take on this thing that you've asked me to do, but that means it's going to be four weeks late. That's the the most comfortable deadline I can give you. Or we can just leave the project as is. Let me know what your options are. You've spoken clearly. You've spoken decisively. You now have trust with you and your client. They may not be happy with what you just said, but they're allowed to have their feelings. But what you've done is you've protected yourself, your mental health, your capacity, your energy, which is not infinite. And honestly, you've protected that relationship because if the client insists on having it their way, all the, no, 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 I want all of this and I want it on deadline and I want X, Y, Z. That's not a client I want to work with long-term. That client is going to be a pain in the ass every single time you do a project with them. And I would rather know that now. So boundaries can be a great litmus test. They are definitely a way of improving relationships. And honestly, they're so incredibly protective of this business that you're trying to grow. Yeah, I feel like it's the same reason you shouldn't do stuff for free for people. I love doing stuff for free for people. And then I get halfway through and I realize that I don't have the resources I need to actually resource the project properly. Because I'm doing it in the evenings or I'm doing it on the weekends or I'm helping out or I'm having fun. And frankly, most of the stuff (laughs) that, that I do requires people better than me. Like I am only good at a few things and to deliver anything, to do anything, to make something happen. I need some resources. I need some time and I need some people. And when I'm busy trying to do it like for a friend or whatever, they just Mm -hmm. don't get all of it. They don't get all of me. They don't get all of the experience. And so it's just like, oh, I've bumped up against it. And yet I still struggle with this. So we're kind of talking about work and clients and stuff because we kind of landed there. But if we take a step back to just the idea of the importance of boundary setting, what is it that keeps us from realizing that we can do this? And then how do we go about it? 
I think the first thing I want to mention is that there are a lot of misconceptions about boundaries. You've already said that to you, boundaries feel selfish. Oh, I think super selfish. That's super, a, yeah, super I get selfish. it. I get it. I think that people think about boundaries as telling other people what to do. And that could not be farther from the truth. A boundary doesn't tell someone else what to do. It tells other people the actions that I am willing to take to keep myself safe and healthy and improve the relationship. So my boundary does not depend on you in any way. My boundary is always within my control and it is the thing that I am capable of or willing to do. And Boundaries aren't selfish. A true boundary is designed to improve whatever relationship you happen to be in. Now, why does it feel so hard? Why do we immediately feel guilty or feel selfish or feel mean or just get that like sense of ick? I think a lot of it is societal conditioning. I will speak specifically about women and about moms because I'm a mom. But as a woman, we have been conditioned by the patriarchy and stereotypically rigid gender roles and sometimes religious influence and diet culture and maybe trauma to be small and to be compliant. As a mom, I'm praised the most when I'm selfless. I have no self. I give everything I have to my family and my kids and then maybe my job and there's nothing left over for me. And if I'm on my own list at all, I'm at the very bottom. I also think that we have this idea of boundaries as selfish because when we have tentatively tried to set them with others in the past, they've told us that we're selfish. They've told us we're being mean. They've told us we have too many rules and we're too controlling. And that's because they don't like you taking away this privilege that they were never meant to have in the first place. And if they can make you feel bad enough about it, then maybe you'll drop this super inconvenient for them boundary altogether. So I think there are a lot of reasons why we think that boundaries are selfish or mean and they make us feel guilty. But I'm constantly trying to reframe for people the way your relationship exists without a boundary versus with and with boundaries, relationships get better. Hard stop. This is what makes us such a perfect conversation for We Do Hard Things because we want to dig into the scary and the difficult and the challenging. You're never going to hit your potential. You're never going to be able to do all of the big things you want to do without being able to navigate some of these these hard conversations. So first of all, it sounds like to me, to set boundaries, you have to know what you want and what you're willing to do and are not willing to do. Yeah, I think... uh, Again, I don't know if it's just me. I've heard you speak about the patriarchy a few times. I understand that this is especially challenging for women. I'm not sure if I'm just some kind of weird dude or whatnot, but I was raised my mom and my aunt and my sister and me. That was what it was kind of growing up. My dad was was kind of around, but not really. And my grandfather was a huge hero of mine. But again, it's like pretty distant. And so I don't know if I've just taken on a lot of the traits that my mom, a woman who is entering her 70s, that generation. And then she passed it on to my sister and and somehow myself, I picked it up. But everything you're talking about, and this is what I don't understand when they're like, oh, women have this and this. I get it. But at the same time, I'm like, I feel all those things too. (laughs) Am I just a weird dude? No. The patriarchy affects all of us, right? The patriarchy also, and like toxic masculinity also tells you that you have to hide your feelings and that you shouldn't talk about what you need or how you feel. You should just be the person who does it and be incredibly definitive and take what you want. And so you have that influence as well. And then even beyond that, there are people with different personality profiles or archetypes. Gretchen Rubin describes this in her book, The Four Tendencies. Some people are obligers. They respond incredibly well to other people's expectations. When other people set an expectation like, hey, will you meet me to go to the gym? You're like, yes, I can do that because I have some outside accountability. They don't do well with internal expectation. So this particular archetype does very well meeting other people's expectations and demands. But when you want to do something for you, it somehow just feels harder or it feels wrong or it feels selfish. So even beyond that patriarchal influence, we've got these different personality types and personality structures. And the idea of wanting to be nice so that people like you is universal. We want to be nice because we want to be loved. And we feel like if we're not nice or if other people are disappointed in our response, then they won't love us. And that's a really primal instinct that I think a lot of people carry that's just simmering in your subconscious, but is really powerful. We want to be liked. 
have you heard the term? I heard it from Oprah, but this idea of the disease to please. Have you ever mm. heard that term? I think so. Something similar, at least. Yeah. Do you know the story of Oprah and Stevie Wonder? Oh. And the first time she ever said no to someone? No. So can I share it with you real yes, quick? Yes, I would love to hear it. So this all has 100% to do with boundaries. And so Oprah you grew up quite poor. She's one of my heroes. I love her. She grew up quite poor. But then she started to see success through the 80s. And she hit a point in her career where her salary, her multi-million dollar salary started getting published in the newspapers. Late 80s, early 90s, something like that. And coming from a poor background, it was easy to set boundaries because people would say, Hey, do you have a few hundred dollars? I need to borrow money. I need money from you. She's like, I don't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> right? Super easy to set boundaries. Suddenly, your multi million dollar salary is getting printed in all of the national newspapers and people know that you have money. So, what are they going to do? They're going to start yeah. asking for money. And so she would give money begrudgingly. She would help people out, but she didn't really want to. She mm -hmm. had her own passions. She had her own causes. She had her own charities. But she didn't realize that like when someone would say, can you give me money? And this applies to all of us. Can you give me an hour of your time? Can you give me the day? Can you have this done on a certain day? Can you do it for a certain price? When she said yes, begrudgingly, she didn't realize that, that she was sharing like, can you give me money? I will give you money for the charity. But all the people here is you want to give me money. Mm -hmm. You're giving me money. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. So what are they going to do? They're going to come back and say, can I have some more yes. for the charity? And Oprah's like, but I didn't want to give it to you last time. But she didn't realize all she was saying was yes. Yes. And then the people would go, oh, great. Oprah just gave us even more money. We can all go to Oprah for money because she keeps giving it to us only because she never told them that she didn't want to do it. She never even gave him the opportunity to say like, I don't really want to do this. So Stevie Wonder comes along. Stevie Wonder, the pianist, and he has this cause. And he asks for a lot of money from Oprah for this charity. And she didn't really want to do it. So she decides she's going to say no for the first time ever. For the first time ever, she's going to say no to Stevie Wonder. She says no. And he goes, okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and he's like, okay, we'll, uh, we'll catch you later. And she thought he was going to say, you selfish woman, how can you have millions of dollars? How can you say you love the children? How can you do all of those things? How come, don't you realize we go back 20 years and I am never going to talk to you again. I'm never going to play a charity for you again. I'm never going to play a song. I'm never coming on your show. How could you do this to me? Uh, That's what she thought. And said so he was like, okay, cool. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs> we often build up these conversations in our head. I have a story like this too with my mom setting a boundary with my mom where I was like, oh, she's not going to take it well. She's going to be so mad. Tell me, tell me. It's going to be this whole what, what thing. What happened? What happened with my it? My mom wanted to come for a visit. It was a couple years ago. My kid was really young. I'm on the phone with my sister and I'm like, mom wants to come for a week and I really can't navigate that. I am in the middle of a really busy work cycle. Like the kid is whatever. I can really only have her come for like four nights. That's as much as I can handle. And she was like, well, just tell her. And I'm like, she's going to hate it. She's going to be so mad. She's going to guilt trip me. She's going to make that face like she's sucking on a lemon. And my sister is like, calm down. Give her the benefit of the doubt. Like you're making up this argument in your head that hasn't even happened. So I finally get on the phone with my mom and I'm like, hey, can't wait for your visit, whatever. Hey, mom, all we can do is like four nights this week. I've got a lot going on at work. I can host you for four nights. And she goes, okay. That was it. So that was a really important lesson for me. But what I tell people all the time is much of the time, the people who are in your life want to respect your limits. They want to have a relationship that feels good for both of you. And they just didn't know you had a limit because every time they've asked, you've kept saying yes. So when you do share your limit clearly and kindly, much of the time they're going to go, oh, okay, thanks for telling me. And you're going to move on. And that's, the beauty, I think, of telling stories like this is like, don't go into the conversation anticipating that it's going to be a battle because that actually changes the way you show up to the conversation. Go in assuming that the other person wants this great relationship with you too. I've also noticed with certain types of people, I'm a big fan of the Enneagram. Like, as a, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with big it or time. not, but... Uh, okay, great. Oh, we can talk Enneagram. And I found that once you understand a certain person's fears or communication styles or what they like, especially since so many of my friends are number eights, and anyone who knows the Enneagram knows that. Are you a number eight? Yeah, I'm a hard eight. Yeah, yeah. Entrepreneurs tend to be eights, either sevens with an eight wing or just eights. And I am not that. I am like the profile that's least likely to become an entrepreneur. But I've realized that there are certain people who tend to speak directly and expect others to speak directly to them. And once you just say it, they're cool with it. 
Like yes. my, my father-in-law is a number eight. Mm-hmm. He bugged me forever for a dog. Forever. He would poke, say, why not a dog? I didn't grow up with a dog. I have four kids. Why not a dog? You need a family dog. No house is complete without a dog. And finally, one Christmas dinner, we're like sitting at Christmas dinner and he's going on and on about the dog. And I just, and I, I'm biting my tongue and I'm biting my tongue. And finally, I kind of lose my temper. And I say, how about this? My wife and I have been together over 20 years, right? Like your daughter. Jack and I have been together over 20 years. We have four kids. I run my business. I have my house. This is our life. How about I decide whether I want a dog or not instead of you? And there was like silence. And he goes, okay. And he never brought it up again. (laughs) And I was like, I felt so bad. Not the time, not the place. Everyone at dinner got really uncomfortable. Yes. I was like, oh, I could just pull my father-in-law aside and be super direct with him. And if I explain it, he's kind of cool with it. Yes. I didn't realize that I had that permission to do that because that's what he expects. It's, I'm like busy. I'm busy tap dancing and tiptoeing around everything. This, that's, this is such a perfect example, though, of why, again, a boundary is a kindness because you held it in and didn't say anything for so long because you wanted to be nice and you didn't want to set a boundary. You didn't want to say, hey, father-in-law, we're not interested in getting a dog right now, so you can stop asking. But if we change our mind... I'll let you know, right? You could have said that months ago and you didn't and you held it in until you exploded. And that explosion was not kind. It could have been harmful for the relationship. He could have really taken offense. Why are you blowing up at me? Why didn't you say something months ago? So that's the perfect example of why setting a boundary early when you recognize that there is a limit and the other person does not realize they have crossed it, speak clearly and kindly. Because that's the best thing for the relationship. You could have pulled him aside during a quiet moment months ago, and then you wouldn't have had the last couple of months where your resentment and frustration just continues to build up. Yeah. And then I yell. Yeah. (laughs) At at, at Christmas dinner, and everyone's like super uncomfortable. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And I've done that too many times. And so, I think the biggest struggle that I have, and we're going to, this kind of overlaps with a lot of stuff, is the idea that being selfish is selfless. And it's not selfish. It's like putting yourself first means you can show up to other areas better. Um, Setting limits on your schedule means that you can be more intentional with your time. Saying no to the client or the change of scope or whatever is going to actually make the project worse, but but you just don't want to be mean or whatever. But, But in each case, being more intentional, being more objective, being less emotional, being more clear with what you need to do and why you need to do it, tends to like remove a lot of the drama from life. And so is it really just as simple as the things I just rhymed off or are there ways we could do this better? I think what you just said is an excellent point. And in the book of boundaries, I have what I call my relationship golden rule, which I talk about in in context with my relationship with my husband, romantic relationships, but it literally applies to every relationship. Say what you mean and trust your conversation partner to do the same. So when you say to me, hey, do you want to be on my podcast? If I don't have capacity or I don't want to, I would say no. And if I say yes, you know I'm saying so with my full self. I'm not going to show up resentfully. I'm not trying to squeeze it into 10 other things. I'm not going to be distracted. It makes our relationship feel very safe and very trusting. So that level of direct communication, it's clear, but it is still kind. I'm not being direct and rude. I'm not going to say like, no, I'll never be on your podcast. But I might say, I don't have capacity in the next three months because I'm on a book deadline. If you want to reach out in September, I'd be happy to reconsider, right? I'm clear, but I'm kind. So I think that relationship golden rule makes all of your relationships better. Imagine if you never had to have this conversation where... You say to your wife, like, hey, is it cool if I go out for a couple hours tonight? And your wife goes, sure. And you never again have to wonder, does she mean it? Am I going to leave for a couple hours and come home to like a shit storm where she's so mad? And how could you have left? And like, I kind of knew she didn't want me to leave, but I left anyway because I really wanted to go out. And then I come home and then she's mad. All of that can be avoided if we just have this clear, kind communication in all of our relationships. And it takes time and it certainly takes trust and practice to build that up. If my husband says to me, are you mad about something? I'll stop for a minute and think and I'll go, no. And he needs to trust that I mean it. And for a little while, it took him a while and he would follow up. Are you sure you're not mad? You seem a little off. You seem a little different. And I would have to say, like, trust me, if I was upset with you, you would know because I would tell you. 
And I'm not. And like, <laughs> number will, right? eight, right? There. Yes. So what's, that, what's the, your husband's Enneagram number? I actually don't know what his number is. He's never like done a test and I try not to like diagnose anyone with any. No, you're not so supposed not, to. No, I'm not sure. But he and I now have the best communication because it is so direct and it's so clear and neither of us takes it personally. So anyway, all of that to say, I think this concept of directness and clearness and clearest kind goes back to all of your relationships, even the business ones where you're like, I'm going to tell you what my limits are and my capacity is. And that's going to be the best thing, not only for my relationship with you, but for me. And so the book has been out since October. What has surprised you most? Because for those you know who are speakers, authors, we know the process, right? You are working through something, you have an idea, you have a concept, it takes you a year or so to write, and then it's sitting through publication for a year. So this is stuff you've been working on for a few years now. But every author I've ever spoken to goes, you know what, I wish I had taken this one principle further. Or now that I'm out here, I'm like, I'm realizing this is the thing that everyone <laughs> is sticking to. And I never even realized it. What's surprising you about the book of boundaries? In the book of boundaries, I outline the three steps of setting boundaries. So the first step is that is identifying the need for a boundary, right? You have to know you need one and where you need one and with who. The second step is setting the boundary using clear, kind language. And the third step is holding it. And now that I'm having this conversation and I've had this conversation for the last six, seven months with people, I realize there's a pre-step that we really need to talk about that a lot of people aren't doing, which is In order to know that we even need a boundary, we have to build in moments throughout our day, every single day to check in with ourselves and to ask ourselves, how am I feeling? What do I need? What would make me comfortable right now? What is my tolerance? How is my body feeling? How is my mental health feeling? Very often I tell people, identify the need for a boundary. And they're like, I don't know what I need. I've been so disconnected from my body and my feelings and my needs for so long, for so many reasons. I don't even know what I need. I've never stopped to ask myself, what do I need? Because I'm so busy taking care of everybody else's needs. So that is absolutely a pre-step that I probably could have devoted an entire chapter to. How to check in with yourself and reestablish a connection with your body, your spirit, your emotions, your mind to help you like connect to to be able to help you figure out what kind of boundaries you need and in what relationships. Do you think you skip that over? Because when I learned about your story, and I'd love to spend some time going and digging into it. Do you think that you had trained this muscle of checking in with yourself, of knowing what you need, of being having a clear vision of what the next step is or what have you. I think most of us struggle with what do you want? I believe that's the most important question you can ever ask. What do you want? And being really honest about it. I think once you understand exactly what you want, you can have a plan, you can take action, everything flows from there. But um, perhaps you didn't focus on it too much because you've just trained that muscle within you over the last 10, 15, 20 years of your recovery of the business work, moving from the insurance company uh, to becoming an entrepreneur, and then everything else. Do you think it just comes too naturally to you? (laughs) Yes, I do. I had experienced trauma at the age of 16 that led me to use drugs. I spent five years as a drug addict. I finally went into recovery, relapsed after a year, went into recovery for the second time in the year 2000, my final time. And then I went through just a ton of therapy. I've been in therapy for the last 25 years, like off and on, but very regularly. And as part of my therapeutic practices, I learned how to reconnect. I had just cut off all connection with my body and my feelings because of my trauma and the drug use. And so I've built in moments throughout my day and practices throughout my day, whether I'm working out or meditating or hiking or just taking small moments to check in with myself. So it has become such a natural practice that I don't think I emphasized it as much as I should have that other people have not begun to or learned to or even been given permission to do this thing that I have reclaimed for myself. So yeah, I absolutely think that's why I didn't emphasize it as much as I wish I had. And how do you after 25 years of therapy and, and I mean, anyone who's seeing you anyone who's meeting you, I mean, I would never have guessed that that your background of five years of drug addiction, and we're not talking just light stuff either. Like we're talking about fairly serious drug addiction and going to rehab and, and then a year later relapsing and what have you. But 
I, I would never have anticipated that. All we see is the brand new version of you, the person who's running an organization to help us embrace new habits and to get healthy and to focus on food and now to focus on boundaries and all of this stuff. And so how have you gotten really good at it? You mentioned 25 years of therapy, but how have you gotten better? What are the little things you do to be able to check in with yourself? Movement for me is a really big part of that practice. So in my recovery, like really early on in my recovery, the second time, I recognized that I would have to change everything about my life if I was going to really make this recovery stick. I needed to become the healthy person with healthy habits that I certainly didn't see myself as at the time. And so I thought to myself, what would a healthy person with healthy habits do? They would get up at 530 in the morning and go to the gym. So I started my practice of going to the gym five or six mornings a week in the morning in 2000. I've maintained it for the last 23 years. And I've come to realize that movement for me first thing in the morning is a way to physically move through my stress, my anxiety, anything that's been popping up, these kind of like hidden shadow work even. I need to physically move my body and get some of this stuff up and going before I can then drop into thinking about this a bit more theoretically or doing like some more detailed somatic work to move it through, process it in my body. So movement is a huge piece of it. I do a post-workout meditation after every single workout. So I move and process and then I sit down and I'm quiet and I reconnect with like God or the universe or past Melissa or future Melissa or parallel timeline Melissa, like whatever is on the buffet of connection. But those are two things that I do every single morning that starts my day off in this form of connection. And through that in then my boundary practice now, like I don't say yes to anything automatically. I don't <laughs> ever say yes, right? I'm always pausing, whether it's for a minute or a second, or I'll get back to you tomorrow, or I'll let you know next week. Like, I don't say yes until I'm like, what do I need? What do I want? Do I have capacity for this? Do I have energy for this? Would I enjoy this? Um, and so those are all just things that I think I've built into my regular everyday routine and all of my relationships that, that help. But it definitely started with a movement practice. That was the beginning, the entry point towards reconnecting with my body. Did you struggle with self-esteem? Because I've realized that a big challenge that we have, uh, doubters or haters or people with a fixed mindset, a challenge that I used to have, was I realized at a certain point that it really came down self-esteem. Like I had to believe that I was worth it. Mm -hmm. That So it's nice to be able to, to talk about tactics. But at the end of the day, I wanted a lot of things, but they were desires. Like I want those things and I know what people do to, in order to get them. And I'm not sure if I'm willing to do the work. And I know that I love the idea of what would a healthy person do? A healthy person would do this thing. So I'm going to be a healthy person. I'll go off and do it. But perhaps we feel like we don't deserve it or it will never happen or it's not worth it. Like those really deep fears yeah. and doubts that crop up. Did you struggle with self-esteem and all of that stuff? Yes. Every single morning I woke up to go to the gym, I would look in the mirror at all of these other people around me lifting weights and running and being fit. And I would think to myself, they don't know that I am a worthless loser drug addict. They don't know that I'm a terrible, awful person who lies and cheats and steals and manipulates like every single morning, I would tell myself because that's still how I felt. But I kept going, I kept showing up anyway. And I will tell you, I probably owe my recovery solely to external validation for at least the first two or three years. I met a group of girls at the gym and we started running together. They didn't know that I was fresh out of rehab. I didn't talk about that aspect of my life with them for a really long time. They just knew that I was new to the gym, new to the city because I had moved and I was interested in running. So I started running with them and they didn't know me as anything other than Melissa, who shows up at the gym five mornings a week. I took a new job and this new job didn't know me as anything other than this Melissa, who was the executive assistant who like quickly got promoted because she was really good at her job. So I surrounded myself with people who saw me the way I was so desperate to see myself. And for a long time, that was enough. And then when I co-founded Whole30 and decided to step off on my own, I really had to do the incredibly hard work of recognizing that I could no longer feed off of everybody else's validation. Because if I allowed their external validation to prop me up, I also had to allow their criticism to cut me down. It's like two sides of the same coin. Wow. You can't have one without the other. 
And that's when I went back to therapy and started doing the very hard work to build my self-confidence and self-esteem from the inside. So I was no longer reliant on what other people said or thought of me. And that took a couple of years. Huh. I always reflect back. I talk to myself a lot. I, I listen to stuff and I'm always thinking back and I always wish that, that I hadn't made mistakes. I always wish that I hadn't wasted time or thought, oh man, maybe there's a way I could have shortcutted it or get it or gotten to the destination quicker. And yet the other side of me, the rational side of me goes, I don't know how I would have done it any different. <laughs> right? Like maybe it's nice to think like, oh, it would have been great. And I hear you say, like you realize that when you launched your business, the things that were motivating you, and I used to be, and I probably still am, but I used to be super motivated by uh, recognition. And so the things that used to motivate you were no longer going to serve you and you had to go back and do that work. We keep circling around the same thing, which is like, this takes time. And you got to work through the process before it'll start to come naturally to you, before it'll start to become easier, before it's something that you just start to do. But like piece by piece, it just takes a long time to get there. And so what advice do you have for those of us who either (laughs) don't want to take the time, want everything to happen now or faster, or even question whether it's worth it? Oh, I mean, when I think about all of the time and energy, like physical energy I spent trying to avoid doing this work, trying to avoid unpacking my trauma and figuring out why I was using in the first place and trying to avoid looking at the relationships that I had damaged in my addiction and how I was going to make amends and looking at all of the stories I had about myself, about why I was still 10 years into recovery and I still thought of myself as someone who was a complete imposter in her role. All of the avoiding was so much harder than just taking the box, putting it down, opening the lid and being like, all right, let's take a look. It's certainly painful. It's certainly uncomfortable. I had to get incredibly comfortable sitting with discomfort, like sitting in uncomfortable feelings and not numbing, distracting, running away, moving away from them in whatever capacity I used to do, because all of those other capacities were really unhealthy. I had to just sit with it and be like, what am I feeling? Where do I feel it in my body? What's coming up for me? Can I remember feeling like this in childhood? And again, I had therapy guiding me through a lot of this. But as uncomfortable, it was nowhere near as hard or energetically expensive as what it took to like hold that stuff off and just like keep it buried and keep it in the dark. I've heard people who lost a lot of weight. I went from pretty heavy to less heavy, but I'm talking people who lost two or 300 pounds often say, yeah, it's a lot of work to change and to become that person. But what I never anticipated was how much effort and work it took just to be like a really obese person or things I lost, the things I missed out on, the little hits to my ego or my self-esteem, the things that I just had to avoid, the things I couldn't do, the amount of effort it took to be able to get up and like, go up the stairs or things like that. And sh- sure, it's work to lose weight or to eat healthier to change my life. But I didn't realize how much energy and work I would free up by not having to do all that other stuff. Yes. The phrase I've been using for the better part of a decade is you choose your hard. Because when I was out there new to Whole30 doing a nutrition workshop and people were saying how amazing it was and how great it was and I was so smart and I spoke so well and I would get so filled up by that. Thank you. That's so wonderful. And then I would go on social media and people were like, you don't have a nutrition degree. You're not like a doctor. The stuff you're saying doesn't make sense. Why do you have so much makeup on? Why do you, whatever. And it would cut me down so quickly. That was so hard. I was living and dying every single day based on what people were saying or thinking about me. Going back to therapy and doing the intense exercises that I did with my therapist to be like, why do you have value inherently as a person? Is it because you have this business? Is it because you have this brand? Is it because you have this social media platform? That has nothing to do with who you are as a person. So what are the characters that nobody can take away from you? The characteristics that make you who you are. And then I want you to get real granular on how you feel about you in all of these different, how pretty are you? How pretty are you? Do you think, are you beautiful? Are you ugly? Are you, let's get super granular on that. So that when somebody says to you, you look like a horse, you're like, that's interesting. I know how I feel about myself. How well do you write? 
so that when you get an Amazon review that says you write like a fifth grader, you could go, huh, that's interesting. That person is choosing to experience me like that, but I know how I write. That was equally hard. But once I had that, then I was like unshakable. And this on the other side where I was living and dying based on other people's opinions, that was going to put me on like just this tumultuous sea for the rest of my life. So they were both hard. I just chose my heart. I love that. And for our listeners, you hold up one hand left. This is where it could be. Or right. It's like, I want that. And yet I find myself and I'm being, I'm moving there. I'm moving there. It's taking years. It's to move from me looking back and realizing like, oh man, I was like the mayor of fixed mindset city. Like yeah. I didn't even, my friend Evan Carmichael got given a copy of Mindset by Carol Dwick. I don't think I'm speaking out of school by saying this. And then I, maybe a few years later, I got a copy of it and I'm reading it. I'm like, this is blowing my mind. And he's like, yeah, I thought it was okay. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, this book is changing my life. And he's like, oh, I worked through it. I don't, he's like, I don't understand kind of what people's attraction is to it. And then the more that I read it, the more I realized, oh, dude, you already have a growth mindset. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, the reason why this is not blowing your mind is because you're like, it just, it comes naturally to you. And as I started looking at people, I was like, oh, my mom even has a growth mindset. And like, like all these people, my dad, where he's just like, yeah, I, you know, if it worked great and if it doesn't, okay, I can learn from it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? How can all these people in my life have this? And yet I don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I felt like that about Mark Manson's The Subtle Art of Not, giving. Of not giving a Yeah. <laughs> I read it and I was like, that's okay. And my husband was like, that's because you give the perfect amount of Fs all the time. Like, of course you don't need this book. You already give the perfect amount. And I was like, oh, cool. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Mark Manson's book taught me that you have to pick up the book at the right time in your life as yes. well. Yeah. So I sure. got that book maybe two or three years ago and I got a few chapters in and I was just like, it felt like a shtick. I was like, yeah, I get it. You're going to, you're going to use the word a lot. Yeah. You give f not f all this stuff. And then a few years later, after I had worked through some other stuff, I guess I was more ready for I'd worked through some of Ryan Holiday's stuff and I learned more about stoicism and yeah. I learned more about objectivity. And now it's like, I love that. Book. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're right. You have to choose. Your heart is going to come your way either way. You have to choose it. Yeah, it's true. And so all along, I've heard this idea of it's uncomfortable. Like to set a boundary and then to say it. Is uncomfortable because you're like, how are people going to react? And then maybe they don't even care, but maybe they'll throw a stink like my kids would. <laughs> and then it's like, no, I'm setting a boundary and you have to do it. And then they might even throw a bigger stink, which is even more uncomfortable. And you have all the fallout of it. And you talked about moving through your, your own path of growth and your own career. It's like facing that that uncomfortable stuff. Like so much of this is just about getting comfortable with discomfort. And so here's the question I have, and maybe this is a bit philosophical, but what you learn when you get healthy and go to the gym, we all learn to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. If you're going to learn how to run, it's uncomfortable. If you're going to learn strength training, it's uncomfortable. Dieting and being hungry or limiting macros or whatever it might be is uncomfortable. Getting up early is uncomfortable. Telling people what you really think, setting boundaries, like so much of this is actually just about being comfortable with discomfort. And so here's the question I have for you. Do you think that the real trick here is just to get comfortable with being uncomfortable in some area of your life? Because if you can do that, it will serve you in all these other areas. You can pick up your boundary thing and go, yeah, cool. Okay, no problem. I'll run with it. That's a really interesting question and a really good question. I think there is some carryover. But I also think that there is danger in assuming that, oh, I'm going to make myself uncomfortable in this one area. And that's going to automatically carry over into other areas. And I will give you an example. I'm a cold shower fan. I've been taking cold showers every morning since 2020. And I'm talking, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, in the middle of winter, as cold as it goes. And I will stay in there for four or five minutes, sometimes longer. I have trained my nervous system to be relaxed in that environment. I sing, I hang out, I like what I do everything in this cold shower, right? I don't take a warm shower at all in the morning. It's only cold. I have become very And now everyone is visualizing Melissa's yeah, shower. <laughs> I am. Usually Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, I got a whole playlist. 
I have become very comfortable in that level of discomfort. And I think it's wonderful because my nervous system now knows that in specific areas of physical discomfort, like I'll be okay. I can breathe my way through it. I can kind of calm myself down. I don't think that would translate into me setting a really uncomfortable boundary with my mom. I think that's a different you don't, you, So when I'm doing a cold shower, because I go from hot to cold, I imagine myself when it's really uncomfortable. I live in Canada. Yeah. So winter, cold water showers in Canada, we're talking like like low 30s is the temperature. And so I imagine myself on vacation in the warmth, jumping off of a cliff and hitting the water and it's like the Pacific or something. It's just like ice cold, but it like helps me visualize this like, okay, we're, oh, it's gotten it's cold. Going. Breathe. And yet I find in other areas of my life when I'm super uncomfortable, I can just go like, just breathe. Like you don't think you can talk your way into, okay, I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to visualize it. I'm going to be, I'm going to have a conversation with her. She's not going to be happy. How's she going to react? Ooh, okay. She can react these ways. What will I do in that situation? How will I like, you can't just like get yourself into it. Yes. So what you're describing is the act of preparation, visualization, and self-talk that's happening in this uncomfortable cold shower experience and applying that same visualization and self-talk to a different uncomfortable situation. That I think translates really well. I just think if we're going to start taking cold showers because we think it's going to make us be more resilient when we have to say no to our boss or coworkers or friends, there's like a missing step in between. And the step is what you just described. It is coming into the cold shower or coming out of it and realizing, okay, that was a situation that I was really dreading, but I feel so good now that I'm done. So that's really good. I was anticipating that it was going to be so much worse than it was. And it wasn't actually that bad. It actually at the three minute mark got pretty pleasant. So that's a really good learning experience. And I learned that when I'm uncomfortable, if I just focus on my breathing and pause that that really helps my nervous system settle down. Now you can take that and move it over into the conversation with your mom. And I think that's an area that can be super duper helpful. Yes. And now I've been on the other side as well. Thank you for that. That is awesome because I'm starting to notice that the people who like are successful at business go like, you can get healthy and then they do. Or the people I'm listening to Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography right now, and he could take the discipline from one area of business and life to another area. And so... I just think that, that it's like pick whatever, like business, life, relationships, your schedule, what you eat, like pick your sleep, pick something that you can control, pick something you can get better at that's a little bit uncomfortable. It really doesn't matter what and just like start taking moves that way because then you're going to get more used to it and better. And then at a certain point, everyone's going to tell you this is the answer because that's what they did, but it doesn't even matter. Like the whole game is just getting more comfortable with uncomfortable things, putting yourself first, building your confidence. Like it's a game where it's eventually going to spread to all areas of your life, no matter what you do, right? Yeah, it will. It definitely can. And it definitely will. Um, And I do think that the, I call boundaries a practice because it requires practice. It requires you going through these steps that might feel contrived. You might have to rehearse the conversation with your mom ahead of time. You might need to write a script down or use a script from the book and read it word for word. You might want to have the conversation via text via versus in person because in person just feels a little too confrontational. It may feel like you're working really hard in the beginning, like it does with any habit, starting to go to the gym, starting to eat healthier. It feels like you're working so hard but it does get easier with time and it does get easier with practice. And it is a practice because you won't always get it right. Sometimes you'll chicken out. Sometimes it won't go well and you won't know what to say. Sometimes you set the boundary and they respect it and then they go back on it two weeks later and you fail to hold it. It all is a practice, but it does spill over into every area of your life. The checking in with yourself, the sense of self-confidence, the recognition that clear is kind, the idea that paying yourself first is not selfish. It benefits not only you, but everyone else in your life. All of that carries over. I I love this because this is like a very us versus them. The way I'm taking it, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Fuck all those people. I'm going to put myself first. Now's my time. This is my year. And then real life happens and you start to prioritize things. But I've actually been on the other side of it. Uh, So there was someone in my life who was really struggling with others in their life. And I was like, you got to put yourself first. You got to set boundaries. If certain things are happening in your relationships, and I'm being vague on purpose, but if certain things are happening in your relationships and you are not self-advocating, if you are not being clear, all these things that you're talking about, 
that is going to impact your anxiety. That's going to impact your stress. That's going to impact your sleep if you're not sleeping well. And I literally laid out this thing because of the person's age where I said like, would you want this discomfort to cost you eight or 10 years on the back end of your life? Like, do you not want to be there for your grandkids or your great grandkids or whatever it is? Because right now you're just too uncomfortable to address these things. And so I like lit a fire under them. And then nine months later, I wanted to do something with them and my family and everything. And they were like, set a very clear boundary. They were like, no, Mark, you can't do this. And I said, why not? And they're like, I just don't, I, with this going on and with this going on and with all these things, we just can't do it. And uh, I was really hurt. I was really hurt. It actually hurt our relationship because while I, and, and I love the fact that they're setting boundaries, it seemed like they didn't set boundaries for anybody And then now that I'm coming along and I'm just like the straw that broke the camel's back, I happen to be the first person asking for something on this imaginary threshold that was set. And it's like, well, it's so great that you have all this time and energy for everyone else. But now that I'm asking for this one thing this year, that's the thing that's going to draw over the line you're going to set the boundary on. And as I was preparing for this, it's like, I so believe in this and I so agree with it, but it it hurt my feelings so much. I think we can encourage other people to set boundaries. And also when those people set boundaries with us, take it very personally and tell ourselves stories about what it means that this person set a boundary with me. And I think that's a very natural and normal reaction. And also other people's boundaries are not my business. I will never know the motivation behind someone else setting a boundary with me? Is it truly an act of kindness? Because they honestly don't have the capacity, the time, the energy. And the kindest thing to say is no to me. And maybe they have other things going on in their life that I don't know that they have not shared. And so in service to the relationship, even though I'm disappointed, I'm going to respect that boundary. And at a later date, when things are calm, I can say to them, man, I was really disappointed that we weren't able to do this. Is everything okay with you? Is there anything you want to talk about? Could we set up another time to do something like that? Is there a different way we could connect in a way that feels better to you? They could also be setting a boundary like you did with your father-in-law because they've held it in and held it in and they blew up. And you were their Stevie Wonder. You were the person that just (laughs) came along at the right time and they had been saying yes to everybody for so long and you are a safe person. Your Probably because I was the one told them to set the boundary. Maybe. So they're like, they're like, Mark understands boundaries. Could be, yes. <laughs> and they know that your relationship is strong enough to withstand setting and holding a boundary. So it's definitely challenging. When other people set boundaries with us, we tend to tell ourselves a different story than when it's us setting the boundary with other people. But I do think that The order to respond to this is first, respect the boundary. Understood. Or maybe I don't understand. But what I'm hearing is you honestly don't have the capacity to do this. And I respect that. And then sharing disappointment or asking if there's more that you can talk about or is there another way that you can connect. But the first thing to do is just respect the boundary. Very often, the way people show up in that initial moment isn't how they're going to show up long term. They may have just in the moment said to you like, nope, can't do it, can't do it. And if you had just said, okay, I understand. And then two days later, you have a conversation and you're like, hey, that felt kind of abrupt. And I was really hoping that we could do this. Would you be open to talking about it a little bit more? Maybe that prompts a different kind of conversation. That is helpful for me. I guess a lot of this is just removing the sting or the emotion from it, becoming a little bit more, a little bit more object. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I get why we take it personally. I really yeah. do. Because you're right. I'd much rather be the dude who's, who's like setting the boundaries for others where it's like, no, I have to do. I mean, as uncomfortable as that is, it still feels like, well, every I'm creating the world and the universe I want to live in for me. When everybody else is doing that, it feels like it's a little bit less in my control. Yeah. So. Well, also remember too, that there's this thing that happens. Gretchen Rubin calls it obliger rebellion, where you say yes and yes. And then Either out of just desperation, you explode or somebody (laughs) gives you permission and somebody says to you, like you just did, Mark, hey, you could say no. And then they go, really? And then they start saying no to everything. They go on a boundary setting room spring up because they've never said no before. And you've given them this like new shiny toy and they say no to everything. And I will tell you that does modulate. So I don't know what's going on with this person in your life, but I can think of a few different things. 
that may have led to that scenario based on the conversation. Okay. So real quick, what is the secret to being able to pick... Like, Let's all pick our Stevie Wonder. I, I love that callback you just did, right? Let's all pick our Stevie Wonder. Let's all decide that today is the day that I am going to set a boundary that makes me a little uncomfortable. And this can be relationship-based or it doesn't have to be. For me, a big boundary was I knew that I had to work out. I knew that I used to work out only in off hours, like non-working hours. And then a big shift that took me almost a year to get comfortable with is saying, I'm going to work out during the middle of the day. Like, Because to me, it's like daytime is work time. Daytime is work time. Daytime is not work out time. And so, so me being able to clear off from like 9.15 to 10.30 every single morning made me feel so uncomfortable. But doing so and like setting a boundary and saying, I don't take meetings and you can't schedule me and you can't get me and I'm sorry. And I'll get calls from people who are like, Hey, Mark, we have this amazing guest for We Do Hard Things. Are you free this day? And I'm like, I really want to. And I say, I'm sorry. No, I can't because I'm working out. Like, <laughs> what? No, cancel the workout. Go take that meeting. What are you saying no for? So today we're all going to set better boundaries. What is the one thing we can do to ease the sting for our Stevie Wonder, the person across from us? So that way we can do this in a way where it's not quite so painful for them. I think the most important thing is to get crystal clear on the boundary that you need. So if we're talking about setting a boundary with someone else, because you were just talking about setting a boundary with yourself, carving out a moment and an hour in your calendar to work out every single day, that's a boundary with you, where you are relying on Mark not to schedule meetings for Mark during this time that you're working out. So that's a self oh, really? boundary. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I still feel like it's only it's Oprah, right? It's easy to say, no, I won't give you money when you have no money. Suddenly you have money. Yeah. Same thing. It's easy for me to say I'm working out at 930 when no one is trying to book me for something. Uh -huh. but as soon as someone's trying to book me for something, that feels like I'm letting them down. Or even I'm a bit embarrassed to tell people like, like it just doesn't seem like a good enough excuse. <laughs> but like, okay, first of all, you don't need an excuse. No, I'm not available. We booked this podcast, you and I, for 10 a.m. Mountain because I don't do calls before 10 a.m. Mountain. Hard stop. You don't know why. I didn't tell you yeah. why. I didn't tell you I don't take calls. I just said I'm available at 10 a.m. Mountain or later. And I don't apologize, by the way. This is the time that I am available for calls. Nobody's going to stick something on your calendar without your permission. So the boundary you're setting here is with you. You are the one who should not override your own boundary by saying to someone else, yeah, I'll slot you into my workout time. And self-boundaries are an incredibly powerful category. We've talked a lot about boundaries in relationships. Yeah. But boundaries with yourself are an instantaneous way of reclaiming time, energy, capacity, mental health, instantly. And they don't require anyone else's cooperation, just yours. They're tricky because if you do override your boundary, who's going to know? Who's going to know that you booked me during your workout time? Nobody's going to jump out of the closet and slap your hand for booking your workout time. But if you can set and hold this boundary for yourself, you have instantly reclaimed an hour, five days a week, that feels good for your mental health. It feels confidence boosting. It helps you start your day feeling proactive instead of reactive. That's an untapped market of boundary categories right there. I imagine though you have to do that though, you have to understand your values and you have to prioritize like what you value more than something else. Yeah. If my wife calls me in the middle of the day. I used to get this a lot. We have four kids. I used to work an hour from home. There were times when they were little where she would call me and say, come home right now. And I would like, I would know the tone or whatever. It's like, I'm, I'm okay, I'm coming home. <laughs> okay. We're about to have uh, one of our children are about to be murdered. <laughs> I better get home now and cancel all meetings and do whatever I need to do because it's that important. Yeah. But short of that, it's like, no, I'm not sorry. You're having a bad day, but no, I'm not. So it's like, you almost have to, for your own priorities, you're right. We're talking a lot about relationships for your own priorities. You have to be able to understand your own value set, don't you? Yes. And I recognize I did not answer the question that you asked at the beginning of this like conversation, but your example of a self-boundary was so good and I thought so important. Yeah. But yes, we often walk around with this just general sense of unease or dread, right? It's the like, when you see the text message on your phone, you just go, oh no, I'm not gonna answer that one. Or when the coworker walks by your desk, you pretend you're busy because you don't wanna talk. Or when 
you know, your spouse. As you're saying these things, I'm I'm literally feeling my anxiety. As you're saying these things, I'm feeling my anxiety go up. Those are the red flags that you need a boundary, right? It's your spouse saying like, hey, my mom wants to come for a visit. And you're like, oh my God, no. Like I have to steal myself for this visit with my in-laws. Those are all signs that a boundary is needed. But you can also just look to your own environment. If mornings feel chaotic and stressful and anxiety ridden and like you're losing sleep every Sunday night because your Monday morning is so terrible and the Sunday scaries come on so big, that's a prime sign. Okay, maybe there are some boundaries I could set around either my Sunday night or my Monday morning to help make that time period just for me feel better. Okay, this is now maybe like an advanced tip, but this is a question for me. This morning, I had this thought. It's Monday, we're speaking. I got up and had a great connection with my wife because we both get up early and she went off. She works at a spa. She got the kids up. So I ate their lunches, connected with them, took them to school, had my team meeting, which I loved. Got ready for the gym and went did my workout. I, I wanted to pre- help prepare for this conversation and be in the right mindset. And someone had booked a meeting with me and I was like, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do it. So I canceled that. I'm out walking my dog, thinking about the stuff we can talk about, working through all of your content and everything else. And then I'm about to set up for this interview. And I I look at the clock and I realize it's a few minutes to noon. And I go, I just spent my entire Monday morning like pretty much doing what I wanted to do in a really amazing energy in a really great space. And then now I get to kind of connect with Melissa. And then my whole afternoon is like awesome stuff ahead. And so... I realized that this is coming on a few years of me like really working through a lot of changes. But I also realized now at a certain point, it, I feel a little bit spoiled. <laughs> and I don't know. It's all probably still all... I, it's all the therapy that I probably have to continue to work through of like, you're worth it. You deserve it. It's okay. You're not selfish. It's probably all the same stuff. You're probably going to keep saying, Mark, all the same stuff to me. But there was this moment of like, huh... I have set my schedule and I have set these things up and I get to do the things I love and it's not at a rushed pace and I get to show up super prepared and I get to do a really good job at everything that I'm working on right now. And I love that. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel like work at all. This doesn't even feel like a Monday. This just feels like, like you could connect with me any day of the week, any day of the year. And I would have loved to have lived this day so far. Is that because I didn't even realize that I had set a whole bunch of boundaries along the way? (laughs) I think so. I think that it is. I think that what you are experiencing is the automation of the hard work of the boundaries that you have been working to set over the last few years. Yes. Maybe one of your boundaries is that you don't roll over and look at your phone right away. Or maybe it's that your morning meeting is the first thing that you do because that grounds you and it helps you to connect with your team. Whatever it looks like, there is no one perfect morning routine that works well for everybody. But yes, I think this is the embodiment and just the living of all of the boundaries that you've set. And clearly you have figured out that if you are able to structure the first few hours of your day, at least in a way that feels productive and grounding and creative and relaxed and and proactive, that trickles into the rest of your day. And even if we hang up and the rest of your day is just a dumpster fire, you are going to go into that with so much more capacity and resilience and creativity and focus than if you started your day off chaotically with whatever happened to come onto your plate. So yeah, I think you're doing it right. And listen, not every single morning is going to be like this. You and I both have plenty of mornings where things go sideways the second your feet get out of bed, right? I can't go to the gym. My kid has a project. My kid is sick. My whatever, all of these things, right? Days go sideways and it happens. But because I bank as many of these mornings as I can, that also gives me more capacity to be like, well, can't go to the gym today. Can't do my morning workout. Like can't do my meditation. But here are like two things that I can do that are going to feel grounding. And then I'm going to manage the rest of my day. Amazing. We only have a few minutes left and I so appreciate your time. There is one more thing I want to touch on and that's the idea of sacrifice. And so I feel like the better you can be at following what you talk about. So being really clear, setting expectations, communicating effectively, it's almost going to like set this filter, this unofficial filter where some people will pass through because they're willing to come along on this ride with you, this change, and other people aren't. And it's going to be really difficult and hard, but 
eventually they'll drop along the way or you'll figure out ways to manage it. But after you go through these first few months or these first few years or whatever it might be of setting this filter, this like, I'm willing to do it, I'm not willing to do it, people will kind of self-select in your life. And I have to imagine you're going to attract more of the type of people that have your thinking, have your communication style, have your ideology. And you're going to kind of move away from the people who keep fighting with you every step along the way. And so as I'm talking this out now in my head, I have to think that once you start doing the hard work, it's going to become easier and easier as it goes when you have momentum, because you're simply going to attract more people who agree with you and turn away those who don't. Yes. And I have very little patience now at this point for bullshit. (laughs) I just don't. I don't, right? I am not, I will not be in emotional wrestling matches with anybody in my life. I will not. So I self-select people rather quickly. I mean, everyone from like clients, right? If you're a, if you're a brand who wants to work with me on a social media campaign and our first campaign goes back and forth and back and forth, and I don't like the vibe and I don't like the energy, I'm not going to work with you again. Hard stop. I trust my gut on this and my gut is never wrong. It works with friends. It works with family. I now have a group of girlfriends who we may not talk, we may not text or see each other for like three months. But then the next time somebody throws out a message, it's like, hey, I'm free this weekend. Does anyone want to meet for brunch? And whoever can says yes. And if you can't, we miss you. And nobody gets mad when we see that like Jane was off skiing with a bunch of her friends or Tessa had an event and didn't invite us. It's like, we are all responsible for maintaining this friendship. Nobody takes it personally. Everybody truly enjoys when we spend time together. I don't have any friends anymore who are like, why aren't you texting me? I texted you. Why didn't you text me back right away? Like, nope, nope. (laughs) I self-select those. And those people probably self-select out because that's just not how I operate. I love it. Oh my goodness. I've learned so much. I have one more question for you. But before I do, where is the best place for people to get the book of boundaries? Uh, Subtitle is set the limits that will set you free or to check you out or to learn more about what you do. Where's the best place for them to go? Everything me is at, is just Melissa Yu. So my website is melissayu.com. Instagram is Melissa Yu. TikTok is Melissa underscore you. And you can find the Book of Boundaries everywhere. Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. And I highly recommend prioritizing your local independent bookstore. Oh, I love that. <laughs> we love our indies, yes. I wish the indies... I mean, I'm a listener to everything. So Audible, unfortunately, oh, yeah. is not is not one of those yeah. uh, independents. But okay, final question for you. At the end of the day, with everything that you've done and with everything that you've seen and all the great people that you've connected with and everything that you're going to do in the future, but at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Showing up as myself. That's it. My like The only thing, the very bottom foundation of everything I do is that I always show up as me. It's the only thing I can't get wrong. It's the only thing that always feels good. And I think as long as I'm doing that, I'm doing it right. 